Hello, everybody. This is High Performance IoT Robotics with Go and GoBot. So whenever I go to my family's house for one of the long and wonderful family meals, inevitably, either some remote family member or friend asks the inevitable question, so are the robots going to take our jobs? And the first thing I always think of is this. This is a video shot at the 2015 DARPA Robotics Challenge. It's the United States Department of Defense's most elite teams of researchers. In this case, it was a, a group of researchers from Penn State University with a robot that was intended to go to a predetermined location select one of several different tools based on the task that had just been assigned, and then take that tool to another location and complete the job. So I'm trying to describe the state of the art of general purpose robotics and artificial intelligence. And the entire time, this is all everybody is hearing. They, they, so Roy Amara, the president and head of the Institute for the Future at Stanford University said, we have the tendency to overestimate the effect of a technology in the short term and underestimate the effect over the long term. So with that, I say to you, welcome. I'm Ron Evans, dead program. And I am the ringleader of the hybrid group. The hybrid group, we are a software development consultancy based in California and Spain, which specializes in doing the software for hardware companies. Some of our clients include Intel, a company called Sphero, which created some of the robots for a movie about uh, wars in the stars. That's all I can say on that one. And we have some projects of our own, the best known of which is GoBot, which is what I'm here to talk about today. But before I get officially started, I just wanna say a special thank you to Moventus, our partners here in Spain, who are hosting me, giving this talk, and also lots more coming from Hybrid Group and Moventus. Anyway, so the Go programming language is a really exciting language it's been gaining by leaps and bounds in popularity. It's created by Google, and Google originally started working on it in order to replace all of their own back-end systems because they needed to transition away from their legacy Python and Java to something which was able to be maintained at Google scale. So um, what we think is Go is a great language or Golang as it's known, it's a great language for programming hardware. So the reason why we think that is, first of all, concurrency. Golang was designed with concurrency in mind. It can use all of the cores on a multi-core processor by default, right out of the box. So you get a tremendous amount of concurrency of modern hardware and processors. Portability. So Go is a compiled language. It is statically linked, which means you get a single executable file with no external dependencies, which you can then copy onto the device that you want to execute on. And you can cross compile, which means you can compile for a different kind of machine than the one that you're currently using. So it's very, very useful when you're working on 32-bit or 64-bit operating systems, possibly from different manufacturers. And then performance. So Go is a compiled language, and it is garbage collected, similar to Java, except it does not have a virtual machine. It has a runtime similar to C. So the most recent version of Go, which is Go 1.8, which is the version um, that we're going to be using for today, the worst case, stop the world garbage collection, which in the world of garbage collectors means the worst possible pause that one could experience in your code is 100 microseconds. That's not milliseconds, 100 microseconds. 
more typically it's around uh, 10 to 30 microseconds. So um, we're now into the realm of real-time programming capabilities, which is what you really need for doing device-oriented programming. So some people, many of you who've done web development or network development are familiar with the C10K problem, which is how can we maintain connections for 10,000 different users on our website at the same time? So that was the sort of canonical problem that needed to be solved for the web. So now with the Internet of Things, we call it the 10M IoT problem, which is 10 million IoT devices all connected all at the same time providing data. So we need to have software which is extremely concurrent, extremely powerful and fast, and extremely robust and flexible to be able to handle these kinds of use cases. So GoBot is a framework that is written in the Go programming language. And so we might think of it as a software factory for hardware-oriented development. Software factories, if you're not familiar with them, are, is a concept for using a combination of patterns, practices, frameworks, and tools in order to build a bunch of software applications that are all in a particular category. So in this case, it's any type of application that needs to interact directly with hardware, whether that be sensors and actuators, just sensors, just actuators, or communicate with other types of devices. So GoBot, we have several different ways that we can use GoBot. The first one is what we call classic GoBot. So classic GoBot is the simplest way that we can use GoBot code, and here is just a overview of the basic design patterns before we look at any code. So the primary entity, the primary concept is the robot. You might think of that as a board or as, uh, it could be a robot, a, literally a robotic device, or it could be a particular internet connected device. And it has adapters, similar to the way that web developers can change which backend database is being used simply by changing the object relational mapper or the ORM, we take that same principle, which is actually known as the adapter pattern, and we apply it to hardware devices. That way you can write some code that works on an Intel Edison, change one line of code, and now it'll run on an Intel Jewel or a BeagleBone Black or a Raspberry Pi or many other different kinds of single board lens computers that we currently support. The next concept are drivers. So if adapters provide the interfaces which allow you to talk to the hardware directly, drivers integrate behaviors that know how to talk to particular kinds of peripheral devices. For example, LEDs know how to blink, buttons know how to be pushed, compasses know how to find their orientation, etc. And then last but not least, we have events. When a button is pushed, how do we let the robot know that the button was pushed so that it can do something? Well, that's where we have GoBot's events. So master GoBot is the mode of using GoBot that lets you use GoBot with more than one robot at the same time or use it with our built-in API. So the concept here is you may have many different robots, a swarm of robots, and GoBot's master or master control program, as we sometimes call it, exposes an API which applications that you write can then call. These could be mobile apps, they could be other external web apps. There's many different modes where you may want to provide an internet connected or MQTT connected or some other kind of connected robot or swarm of robots. And so that's what master GoBot is about. And then last is metal GoBot. Metal GoBot lets you just call directly to the lowest level GoBot hardware routines that um, if you don't want to do anything more than have some direct hardware control over some particular device, then Metal GoBot's for you, but we're not gonna really get into that today. So how about some demos? Yeah, I like demos. So the first thing let's start with is Hello World. I don't know how many people out in Internetlandia are actually experienced with Golang, so let's just start with a very simple Go program, Hello World. So in Go, the, we have a package main, which is the equivalent in your C or C++ program as your main routine. 
We import, which is the same thing as import in Python or require in JavaScript or Ruby. So it brings in an external library. In this case, it's a package called FMT, or as we gophers call it, FUNT. So the FUNT package is one of the standard packages that's included in Golang. And so the function main, the thing that it does here is simply FUNT print line, hello world. And that's all it does. So let's go over to um, our uh, demo here. And let's type in go, run, and then hello.go. And we see that it output hello world to the console. All right, great. So now let's do the hello world of things using an Arduino 101. So uh, this is my Arduino 101 that I have right here. And I have it plugged in just to my notebook computer um, initially. We're going to use this in a couple of different modalities, but we'll start with uh, just simply plugged in directly through a serial interface. And so the hello world of things is turning on an LED or turning off an LED, a blinking LED. So let's take a look at that code. So once again, we have package main, which is uh, just regular go. And then the packages that we're going to import, we have the time package, which is just the standard Golang time package. That's how we're going to uh, do things on a particular periodic interval. We have GoBots package. And then we have a couple of different packages that are sub packages part of GoBot. We have the driver's GPIO package, which is where we keep the LED and the button drivers and other types of uh, peripherals that talk directly to the GPIO interface on your uh, hardware device. And then we're going to use the Fermata platform. The Fermata platform is how we can use an Arduino or other compatible microcontroller as an external peripheral and connect it to then some other type of computer to be the brains of the operation. So the main program that we're going to run here is, first we're going to say Fermata new adapter. So that's how we're going to connect to that Fermata. And we're going to do that on the port dev forward slash TTYACM0, which is a standard Linux port, serial port address. Then next we're going to say LED is equal to the GPIO new LED driver. This is the LED driver from the GPIO package. And we're going to tell it to use the adapter that we just defined here and to use pin 13, which is the built-in LED on most Arduinos. And then last, the work that we're going to do is that every one second, the function that we're going to call is we're going to LED.toggle. So toggle turns the LED on if it's off or off if it's already on. So we've got our connection, we've got our devices, and we've got our work. And with those three principles, we define our robot. We say our robot's called BlinkBot. It has a single connection, the adapter that we define. It has a single device, the LED, and then the work. And then we tell the robot to start. So we've basically defined everything that we need our hello world of things to do. And so if we go to our code here, and we say go run, and then it's called arduino.go, and We've got our code running, and we see our LED blinking. OK, very, very simple, but building on top of these things, let's continue. So now we've got output. Let's do some input as well. Let's use our Arduino 101 and add a button as well as the LED. So let me stop my previous code here. So I'm going to connect to my Arduino 101 now using a Grove Shield, which is a very handy device that I use for prototyping when I don't want to worry about soldering or breadboarding. And so I'm going to plug in the 
LED to digital port two, digital port two. And then I'm going to plug in my button, got a button here, and I'm gonna plug that into digital port three. All right, and so we can see that. So let's go to the code. So, um, so now I'm gonna run a program that is called, uh, what's it called, button. Very new, original name. And so when we run our button program here, every time I go and I push the button, the LED is gonna turn either on or off depending on its previous state. So push it to turn it off, push it to turn it on. So let's take a quick look at the code. So the way the code works, package main again, so we import the main GoBot package, the same GPIO drivers package, and the Fermata package. We do the same thing as we did before. We create a new adapter, Fermata new adapter for that port. We have the same LED driver as before. This time we plugged it into pin two instead of pin three, as you saw. And then we have a button, which we use the new button driver, also using the Fermata adapter, and this time plugged into pin three. And the work that we're gonna do is when with the button on a GPIO push event, it's going to call a function with whatever data there was. In this case, we don't care about the data. We're just simply going to LED toggle each time it's pushed. And then we define our new robot with our single connection, our two devices, and then our work. Oops. Hit the wrong button there. I knew something that was going to go wrong like that. All right, beautiful. So, um, so it's very, very simple ideas, but let's keep adding on them. Let's build a complete app now. So this app I call Mini Luminado. So Mini Luminado um, would be Spanish for uh, a little bit lit up. And it is a solar power monitoring system and it has three different subsystems. It has collection of sensor stations. It's got a base station here at our corporate headquarters that we use for monitoring. And then it has a repair system that we send out when we need to fix any of our generation stations that are broken. So this is sort of a little high level diagram. We're gonna use an Edison for the sensor stations we're going to use a gateway with an Arduino 101 plugged in for our uh, base station. And then we're going to use a Parrot drone for our repair station. And we're going to coordinate all of that work using MQTT. MQTT is a machine-to-machine -machine messaging protocol, which uh, originally created by IBM, but now currently maintained by the Eclipse Foundation. Uh, famous for the editor of the same name. Eclipse Foundation has a lot of really great IoT technologies that are all open source, so very much worth checking out. We're gonna be using their Mosquito web, uh, MQTT server today as part of these demos. All right, so first, the sensor station. So the sensor station is gonna use the uh, Intel Edison plus sensors and a, an MQTT server. So let's take a quick look at kind of a little bit higher level diagram. We have the Edison and on the Edison, we're gonna run the Go code. So the difference between the hello thing of world or hello world of things that we did is in that case, we were actually running the program on my notebook and communicating with a serial interface connected Arduino. In this case, we're gonna actually run the code right on the Edison itself and we're gonna to talk to an LCD display that's connected and a rotary dial to simulate the power production station since um, I couldn't move the uh, solar cells inside here. Um, and then we're gonna to talk to the Intel IoT gateway that's running the MQTT server. So let's take a, uh, a little look at some of our stuff here. 
unplug a few things. So um, first of all, I have my Intel Edison. So this Edison is connected to um, an Arduino compatible breakout board with a Grove shield, but a more typical application uses a custom shield that I can't show you. But, um, but we're gonna use this Grove to make it simple so that we can actually see everything that's going on. And it's running entirely off of battery, so we're connected uh, through a Wi-Fi interface to the Edison, which is a single board Linux computer all of its own. And so let's connect uh, two different devices. First one is let's connect a uh, LCD display. So this is a backlit LCD RGB display. It uses the I square C or I two C for the uh, younger people uh, among us. So we'll plug that into the I two C or I square C interface, depending which one you prefer. Right there. And then let's plug in our analog sensor. So our analog sensor here, it's just a simple rotary sensor, a potentiometer. And we're gonna plug that into analog port two. So, so far we've used digital ins, digital outs, I square C and analog interfaces as part of our demos. So, all right, so let's take a quick look at the code. So this code is, is a little more complex, uh, but not too much. So once again, the main package, we're gonna import a few of the Golang standard packages that we're gonna need, as you'll see in a minute. We have the GoBot main package. And here we've got the analog IO or AIO set of drivers. We've got the I square C drivers for GoBot. We've got the Edison platform for GoBot, and then the MQTT platform for GoBot. So let's take a, our, take a look at our main program, and we'll just go over this very relatively quickly, just to get a sense of it. So we first we create an Edison.new adapter. This is the same idea as what we did with the Fermata.new adapter, except now, we're, if you recall, we are running right on the Edison itself. So then our first uh, device is we have a new analog sensor driver and that's connected to the Edison on pin zero, analog pin zero. And then we have our screen, which uses the new Grove LCD driver and again uses the Edison adapter. So now we have a second adapter in this application. It's our server. And so we declare an MQTT.new adapter. We pass in the name of the server, that way we can configure this program to talk to different servers, depending on what our needs are, and uh, we'll call it sensors. So the work that we're gonna do is, whenever the light data changes, we're going to save that data. Okay, we're gonna save that in our light variable. And then go bot every 100 milliseconds, we're going to create a new buffer to transport the data. We're gonna put the data into it in little endian format, which means the smaller bytes first and then the bigger ones. And then we're gonna publish that to our MQTT server under the topic, Min Illuminado Sensors Light. So MQTT servers separate the messages that are published and subscribed based on something called topics, which look very similar to URLs. And then we publish the data bytes, the actual data itself that we put in there. So we're gonna do that every 100 milliseconds, so pretty frequently. And then every 250 milliseconds, we're gonna clear the screen, move the cursor back home, and then we're gonna display the current light value. And based on that value, we're gonna set the color of the screen. Either green, if everything's working fine, blue if the power production is not quite enough, and then red if the system's not working. And then last, most importantly, we bring it all together. We say robot, new robot, and that's our sensor module. Our connection has two adapters, the Edison and the server. We have two devices, the light sensor, in this case it's rotary, and the screen, and then the work we're gonna do, and then we start. All right, 
So we are on my computer, and the first thing that we would need to do is compile this program to run on the Edison. So the way that we do that is we use the go build command, and we say go build, and then sensors is the name. But there is one thing we need to do, which is we need to tell Go before it builds this, before it builds the executable, what is the target platform? So we use two environmental variables. We say Goose or Go operating system, Go OS. So the Goose is going to be Linux. And then the Gorch, which is the Go architecture, is going to be 386 because the Intel Edison is a 32-bit operating system. And on my computer currently, I'm running a 64-bit operating system. So all I, that's just all I have to do. I start the cross-compiler. It compiles. And in a brief moment or a few, depending on um, how much code that you need to build and how many different packages you might need to bring in. In this case, we had a little collection of them. So in a minute, eventually it will compile. There we go. All right, so now all we have to do is transfer this file over to our Edison, which we can do using the SCP command. So SCP is a Linux command to do secure copying of files. And so we're going to copy the, uh, the new sensors over. And uh, we're going to copy it to a directory that I have on the Edison. So I need to enter in my password. And it copies it over. All right, now our code's on the Edison itself. So all we have to do is I'm already I'm logged into my Edison here. And so if I, uh, I can see my scanner program, or excuse me, sensors program. And so the sensors program, we can run it. And it takes one parameter. Let's take a look at how that code works again. So it takes one parameter, which is the server that we want to talk to. So that's going to use the MTTT server with the simple TCP protocol. And it's running 192.168.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.
And so this is the Edison with the sensors program, as we saw before, connected to the Gateway's MQTT server. Now we're also going to run some Go code on the Gateway itself. We're going to run the basestation.go program, which is going to use a connected Arduino 101 to illuminate some LEDs and tell us the system. Basically, it's like an information radiator. Here in our corporate headquarters, we need to monitor all of our production systems and make sure that they're working correctly. And if not, we need a big, bright light telling everybody that's not the case. So all hands on deck, we can make sure to fix it. So I'm going to take my Arduino 101 here. I'm going to plug it in to the Gigabyte Intel IoT Gateway through an, a serial interface, similar to how I was connected before. This gives me the full set of GPIO, I2C, and, and analog capabilities added right to the gateway itself. And then I'm going to connect onto that a little shield that I made in my workshop. This lets me control five, uh, use five volt control voltages to control 12 volt lighting, like this very inexpensive, wonderful Chinese LED lighting that I use for everything. So I'm going to plug that in to the top here carefully. I don't bend any pins again, which I've been known to do from time to time. Okay, so we got that plugged in. So let's power it up with a 12 volt power. And let's go take a look at the code real quick. So the code is pretty simple, um, relatively simple, again, in, in terms of the number of lines of code typically needed to do this sort of thing in C++ or, or other more industrial-oriented languages like Golang itself is. So we're going to use some the same standard packages that we used um, before. Uh, we're going to use Gobot. We're also going to use Gobot's API because we're using master Gobot in this example just to give you a little taste of, of Gobot's own API capabilities. We're going to use the GPIO drivers. We're going to use the Fermata platform to talk to that connected Arduino, the MQTT platform to talk to the MQTT server. That way we can receive the messages. And then we've got our RGB LED driver, which is a driver to control uh, RGB LEDs, not just regular LEDs. And then on our server, we have our light and then our drone, which are both MQTT drivers. You might think of them as virtual devices. We are going to be receiving information or sending information to these devices as if they were physically connected to the gateway, even though they're actually connected remotely via some type of wireless protocol. And then we have two atomic values. So Golang, I have mentioned, is really, really good at concurrency. The atomic value is a value which is absolutely guaranteed to be concurrent, meaning it will not be affected by race conditions. So if you have one Go routine running that's putting data in to the light level and another one running at the same time taking that data out, how do you make sure that these operations are synchronized? That's what Golang's atomic value does for you automatically. So we take a look at our code here. So this time we say gobot.newmaster. So we're using master gobot. And then with this one line of code, api.new api master, we tell gobot's master that we want to use the gobot api, and then we start the api. From that point on, it's very similar to what we've done before. You may remember the Fermata new adapter. We're using the new RGB LED driver with attached to pins three, six, and five. And then we have our MQTT server's new adapter. And we are using the light driver and the drone driver, even though we're not quite to the drone yet. So the work that we're going to do is when we receive light data, we take that data and we take that payload apart from the MQTT server. We read the level in, and then based on that level, we may, if we're already blinking, which is the behavior. So just a quick description of the behavior. 
The same way that the display on our Edison turned green, blue, or red, we're going to make the exact same style of display um, in a much more exciting format turn red if things are not working. Again, it's an information radiator for our corporate headquarters. And then our drone, when it's uh, flying, we're going to be blinking. And when it's not flying, we don't blink. And so then we just have a, uh, this is just one of the functions we have that loads in the atomic value for the light level and then based on it sets the RGB color. This is guaranteed to be uh, safe for go routines to avoid any possible race conditions. All right, so let's uh, go run the code. Enough talk, some, let's run some code. So, um, let me switch over to that pane. And if I run the base station code, and so if we take a look at our, um, our camera, you can see here that we have a very brightly lit information radiator, which is actually literally our base station. That's where our drone station is staged. Uh, and so if I go and I move the, uh, we, can, we can see the color here. So if I go and I turn the knob on my connected Arduino, or sorry, my connected Edison. So if I turn that knob down, then we can simulate a power outage. So based on the status of the sensors, the base station changes its color in a really visible and obvious way. That way we know absolutely for sure that something needs to be addressed and that is the third part. But first, before we do that, I, uh, I promised you APIs. So Gobot has its own built-in API. It's called uh, Robo and it's a single page web application that's right built in. It's built using React. And so we can just take a quick look at it so it brings up a single page web interface and it's running on the base station. And we can see our different devices. You might recall we have our RGB LED. We have the two virtual devices, one for the sensors and the other for the drone. So if we take a look at the RGB LED device, we can see it exposes some commands. That way, for example, if we were to turn it off, even though it's gonna keep turning on by itself, you, um, because the other Go routine that's running is taking a look at the sensor data, but this kind of just gives you a sense of some of the things that you can do with the built-in REST API. All right, let's close this window. And let's go to the third and the final subsystem, the repair system. So the repair system, um, let's just make sure my jewel is running. We'll reboot the jewel real quick uh, while I describe what this is going to do. All right, so the repair system uses an Intel jewel connected to a Parrot Mini Drone, a PlayStation DS3 controller, and an MQTT server. So the idea here is, based on this diagram, adding to it, and this is the final diagram. So we have our Edison sensor system. We have our gateway base station, and then we have our Joule, which is basically our flight control system. So on that, we're gonna be running um, a couple of different processes. We're running an MPEG streamer, which is how we're gonna get our video data from the first person video on my drone. And then a drone program, which is actually going to control the drone. It's using a Parrot mini drone connected via, it's a uh, Parrot, Mambo mini drone, which is one of their newest drones. And then it is um, connected using a joystick, as I had mentioned. So these are the different, so let's take a quick look at the code. Well, uh, first let me plug in my, uh, let's move some of these things out of the way. So I've got my, um, this is the Intel Jewel. And uh, I've got a fan attached to it and it's connected to a USB hub on in, 
because it only has a single port and I have a few different devices. One of them is my uh, radio frequency receiver for the video camera on the drone. And then I have also connected to it my PlayStation 3 controller. This is a clone PlayStation 3 controller because uh, I've broken a lot of these, it turns out. And then the drone itself is this uh, Parrot Mambo. And so the Parrot Mambo is, um, it, I have attached to it a, a custom modification that is a first person video camera, which is then connected to the drone's power. The Parrot Mambo actually offers a couple of power connectors on top, and so it lets us uh, connect. So let me pull one of my batteries here. Let's turn, the, let's turn this guy on. Make sure it's well attached for flight. That's kind of important. And we will put it into its launch location. Let me move the controller out of the way there. So that's where we're gonna, so our base station, we can see that we've got a power outage and we need to send our drone. Yeah, that's kind of fun. All right. <clears throat> so let's see if our um, tool is boot booted up. Yes, it has. Excellent. So I'm running um, Ubuntu on the Intel Jewel. And so I'm gonna have um, two processes. The first one is going to be my video. And let's see here. All right, so first we've got our video running. So, um, yeah, there we go. So that is some streaming video that's actually coming directly from um, the MJPEG streamer that's on the drone itself. And so uh, hopefully that's not too much latency. It's uh, taking a couple hops over the internet. All right, excellent. So let's take a quick look at the code. So um, we have package main, that's always our, our staple. We've got a couple of our Go standard packages. We bring in GoBot, the BLE or Bluetooth Low Energy platform, the joystick platform, the MQT platform, and the Parrot Mini Drone platform. And so we're gonna use four different atomic values because we need to coordinate simultaneously the Go routine that reads the joysticks and then the Go routine that actually controls the drone. So we have our left X, left Y, right X and right Y, uh, in a way that are guaranteed to be safe from race conditions. And so um, our main program, we're going to create our new joystick adapter and we're gonna use the DualShock 3 configuration. We have our new drone adapter and that's going to use uh, the mini drone driver off of the Bluetooth low energy adapter. We have a number of different Bluetooth low energy drivers that all support the same adapter. And then the third adapter is the MQTT server. So the work that we're gonna do is, um, the important parts are the uh, triangle takes off, which tells the drone to take off and then sends an MQTT server message telling us that the drone has taken off. And then the X for landing, which is what tells us uh, that it's landed. And then uh, every 10 milliseconds, we're going to get the value from the sticks, atomic value, and then based on that, tell the drone uh, which directions to fly in. And then we put it all together with our new robot, which has, in this case, the joystick adapter, the drone adapter, and the MQTT adapter, and then two devices, the joystick and the drone itself. All right. So let's go to the um, other side of our jewel here and we'll switch to our GoBot demo. And let's see if we can get this to run, hopefully. So the first one is the uh, the name of the drone. Um, I seems like 
forgot the name of the drone myself. So I'm going to do a scan so I can get the name of all the different Bluetooth Low Energy devices I have. Yeah, there we go. It's this Mambo. It's this Mambo and not one of the other many Mambos uh, that may be flying around at any given time. All right, so we run our drone command. And we tell it which drone to use. And then we tell it which MQTT server to use, which, if you may recall, is 192.168.0.83. Um, on port 18.83. And if the demo gods are good, and let's switch over to the video. Make sure that's still working. Is that still streaming? It's kind of, I think it's got a, little, got a little too much latency. Let's restart the video process. And go to the previous window. Just refresh that. And hopefully that, yeah, that's a lot better. All right. Now, I personally am going to use my first-person video uh, glasses probably to, uh, to fly this because uh, I need a little bit less latency and more um, performance, or else I may crash. But first, let's go flight. Hi, everybody. All right, so this particular drone is quite stable. Stable enough for me to take off my glasses and put on my first person video goggles. All right, and there's my control. Take you on a little tour of uh, our office here that we're just getting set up. Whoa, oops, so much for that flight. I hit the wrong button. Sorry, everybody. But you can see that it was working um, as you expected. The lights are flashing because we were in flight. Let me run over and uh, recover my pieces real quick. See if we can. Uh, we're almost out of time, so I don't know if I have time to uh, make another attempt. But I think you guys got the idea. So was that fun? Hopefully everybody enjoyed that and it was also informative. We invite you to join the IoT and robot and drone evolution because revolutions have downsides, but evolution is constant. And so please check out the software at gobot.io. You can follow us on Twitter at gobot.io. It's all open source. It's licensed under the Apache 2.0 license. So it's available for you to use on your commercial Internet of Things projects. And with that, I thank you. So if anybody has any questions, comments, feedback, uncertainties, all of this code is, um, will be available online. Uh, most of it already is, but there will be the specific uh, slides and the code. Also, all the code I use for bringing the video into all of my um, right into my slides, which is always something people are interested in. Um, I probably spent too much time on just that part alone, but it's very very useful. I'm just putting my uh, camera back, my drone back together here. We might can we can maybe if we have a don't have any questions and we have a couple of minutes, we can make a short flight because I still want to show you. Uh, my aerobatic techniques. So this is a, a special 3D printed uh, first person video camera, which um, it's very typical when flying drones, uh, even the very high end professional ones, which this is obviously not, but it, it's very typical that you will have multiple channels. You may have analog channels like this one for the fastest low latency video, and then you may have your high definition cameras or your instrumentation in the drone itself. That's the point of the drone mission is probably to capture that footage, but you need very low latency um, connections in order to fly things, even though I um, obviously need more practice uh, 
I must have been nervous. I was flying around before just fine. So um, I see a question from uh, Jin. Like Gobot, are you willing to make pybot.io? So um, the design patterns that we developed as a part of Gobot are actually implemented in several different programming languages. Um, some of them are from our own team and some are from others. Uh, we have uh, Cylon.js in JavaScript and R2 in Ruby. There's also a Python version, which we haven't actually worked on directly ourselves, <coughs> called a Zerg framework. So, um, but that, that is from a team um, at, I believe, Drexel University. Um, I haven't really checked it out in a lot of detail recently. Um, I don't know what, how maintained it is, but it uses the same design patterns. Um, so I also see a question of, uh, do I use Golang as my primary language for development? So um, I'm in a very unusual category in that I program in multiple languages on a regular basis. Um, so on you know, your typical um, two week period, I've written Python code, JavaScript code, C++ code, and Golang code. Um, and uh, one thing I've learned is the things you can do in Go are just a lot, especially the cross compilation has saved me so many times. The, you know, that has proven to be the bane of your existence with a C++. And then not having any external dependencies typically, um, you know, that can be quite challenging when trying to install Python or JavaScript is, you know, trying to get the, de the dependencies of your dependencies are not your friends. Let me put it that way. All right, I think we, uh, we could try a flight. Let's try again. Here we go. All right, this time I'm ready. Put on my goggles, take off my glasses, put on my goggles. And let's take a little ride. This is fun, isn't it? These, this is the uh, future site of the first uh, European Intel Innovator Lab, by the way, for those uh, in the know. Right, let's see if we can make it back. Yep, that's me. Well, I hope the stream worked. Well, for sure, for me, that was fun. I hope it worked. Two questions. First one, can I do GoBot with Progressive Web App and Service Worker? Um, so there's no reason why you couldn't integrate with GoBot via one of those as far as if you were going to be calling, you know, the REST interface or an MQTT interface. But since it's written in Go and compiled, it doesn't really run inside the browser at all. It runs separately as a separate executable on your machine. And then uh, the question, it's a beautiful place, where am I? So I'm in the Parque Tecnológico de Estudias, which is on the northern coast of Spain. Um, this is the industrial hub of the northern Spanish region, and it's the home to some very, very innovative Spanish companies like Moventus, where I am right now, for example. So the question is, do I see Golang being used more in future IoT projects versus C++ or Python? Um, definitely. So um, the quick version of the rant is, so I, C++ is, you, you can't really go wrong by choosing C++ for any type of hardware-oriented project. But also, you don't have many of the advantages of modern software languages. Um, you know, you don't have the kinds of concurrency primitives that you do in languages like Go or Elixir. Um, you don't have the safety of things like Go or Rust. So, um, and you know, really JavaScript and Python being interpreted, there are many disadvantages, performance obviously being a really key one, but also, you know, safety on the device itself. You, you have, uh, if you have compiled code and you're able to code sign that code, when you execute it, you're a lot safer executing it on the device versus interpreted code. The downsides are limitations of using Golang for IoT. Well, um, right now, the main limitation has to do with the Golang community is still growing very rapidly. 
it was a uh, TOB's language of the year last year for its growth, but it still does not have anywhere near as many human beings programming as other languages. So, you know, contributors wanted, you know, adding more contributors to do development on the Bluetooth or energy stack, adding more hardware devices, uh, doing work on the open CV stack and some of the other tools, um, like open rave and, and some of the other things that are used in industrial robotics. So, you know, really that's where it needs to go to fully evolve into its position as the preeminent tool for IOT and robotics development. Great, listen, thanks so much everybody. Really appreciate it and uh, see you next time. Bye everyone.